Okay, great. Lovely to see the message. We have people from Mogadishu, from Melbourne, from Kurdistan, from Tunis. Uh, where else have we got people? Lots and lots and lots. This is good. From Amman. Thank you, everyone. It's lovely. And from Kabul. From even. <laughs> and even more. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to jump into localization and site support. So I am going to hand over to Juan, who's going to take us forward in this session. So thanks, Juan. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie. Um, and, and as Charlie mentioned, we're going to be talking about localization. And, and I think it's a topic that is being discussed a lot in a lot of different forums. It's, um, you know, like we have various commitments um, at, at the institutional level, global level, country level, on how we can better engage um, local actors in humanitarian response and coordination. Um, I'm very excited today, actually, because um, we have a couple of really interesting speakers joining us. But before, before we do that, um, I want to just, again, maybe reiterate the fact that please use the chat function as we go through the session. Please do type in your questions, comments, um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat quite closely as we go, um, and and that um, I hope that this is going to be a you know a lively and and interesting and, and constructive conversation on how we can move forward around localization in CCCM. Um, and next up, I'm going to have um, Alisa share with us um, a little bit about where we are on localization. Um, within the cluster um, and within several um, operations. Sorry, Jen, can you just go back one uh, slide? Um, I think we've had various discussions on how CCCM is slightly different uh, than ongoing, I think, broader discussion around localization uh, based on the fact that we usually don't have a, a counterpart that are already existing in country. Um, agencies and organizations take on managing displacement sites, usually only after a crisis and displacement has happened. And as such, I think the way in which camp management is done, I think also from the last two days of discussion shows how much of a the combination of social and, and physical, um, you know, what some of my uh, panelists today call you, you have the hardware and the software. And I think the software in particular is extremely cultural specific, country specific. Um, and I think in some examples we're gonna see today, pot potentially even provincial or district kind of specific. Um, so we're gonna approach this. I think I, I invite you all to, you know, join in with an open mind um, and, and, you know, contribute your inputs and comments to see how we can move this conversation forward um, in relation to CCCM operations and coordination. So we're gonna like to start, we have um, two polls questions. Um, sorry, Jen, I wasn't quite ready earlier, um, but now I am. Um, you already have, I hope, your mobile phone in hand um, because we're going to continue using Menti um, throughout this session. Um, and so first, we, the Menti code for this session is 96342065. Um, and I'm just, if you see it at the top of the, um, the screen, or I'm gonna put it also in the chat for us. So one word that comes to mind when you hear localization, what do you think about Charlie when you hear localization? I think about power and I was just grabbing my phone to try to type in power, but I've not been quick enough. So I'm just gonna say it because I think it's, I think localization is fundamentally about a shift of power. Um, mm. And I think that's why both it's so important, but also it's so challenging and difficult because you only shift it by releasing it or relinquishing it a little bit. Mm. And I think there are, there it is, power relationships. I think there's, mm. a, there's a, lot of, a lot of power being held in certain places that is, people are uncomfortable to, to relinquish. Mm. So yeah, I think power. Yeah. I think another um, thing to think about as we go into today's is, 
I think we're also trying to be as honest as, as we can about this discussion. And I think power is, is a really good starting point from Charlie. And I see like a different iteration of power in the words that are coming in. It's whether it's transfer of power or it's, you know, we think we're gonna empower other people. Um, or we see it as, you know, building up capacity so that they are able to take on, you know, the power. Um, and, and I think if we're honest, it's, it's also a hard thing to let go for many humanitarian organizations um, and yeah, and everyone involved, right? I think we all hold different pies of, of the power. Um, and, and I think, you know, we need to make a serious shift and be honest about what kind of change we're trying to make um, to do that. I can see like how empowerment uh, and capacity building, ownership, money, definitely, I think funding, but I think it's very clear on uh, from what's coming in on Menti as well on, you know, I think it's, yeah, ownership, it's, it's very much on everyone's mind when we talk about localization. So, ooh, next question is, um, it's actually a test. Um, for everyone involved. Um, granted, I don't think we've given you an answer before, but uh, but we want to see what you think. Oh, of the optimist, uh, yes, more than absolutely. So how many local NGOs and partners um, uh, is works with um, CCCM cluster globally? This is most nerve wracking. Um, I think I also want everyone to think back to the conversation we had yesterday around participation. And I think it very much apply to the conversation we have on localization because turning up and you know grabbing a seat or signing your organization's name on a, on a sign in sheet at a meeting doesn't mean that we've achieved localization because I think it has to be a meaningful participation and engagement. Um, and, and I think as a sector that talks so much about participation and you know, moving up the, the ladder of participation that Gio was talking about yesterday, it's, you know, I think we're trying to both look at the quantitative as, as well as qualitative um, data that we can, and information that we can gather. So I'm going to invite Alisa to, to join us to give us some more insight and, and maybe the answer to this uh, question on how many partners we have as a CCCM cluster. Hi, everyone. Um, so the Mentimeter question was a bit tricky, as you have seen. It was less than 100, more than 100, 200. Um, in reality, we have 93 national partners. And that time only counting clusters. So cluster cluster operations with an activated cluster. Um, this corresponds to almost 43%, which is almost half. So you're talking about 50% almost. And that's kind of solid an approximation, half by half between international agencies and national agencies that are working with CCM. We do have challenges in those figures. I'm not gonna be um, trying to make them a perfect, they're not perfect. We do have challenges collecting those figures. Um, there is challenges in terms of collecting the figures, um, in terms of funding, for example, how much does the local actors receive funding? Um, especially that uh, a lot of times as a big, for example, UNHCR, we do have implementing partners that are national actors. Um, so who do we count there? So that's one of the questions that kind of we need to figure out when we are counting those um, partner wise. Also, does it mean um, how many local staff do we have? And that will be obvious also in the next slides. Um, that was quite an interesting to showcase. Juan, can you please change the slide? Yes, the registration data. So, when I was looking at the 
cluster number of partners in terms of local partners, um, I got quite interested to see how many people will be registered for this event from national partners. Um, just to see how are we corresponding in terms of figures. The first finding that I kind of found out is it corresponds directly to the biggest countries that we have uh, with cluster partners of national uh, national type, which is Syria, Somalia, and Yemen. Those are the three biggest cluster operations with national partners. And it, this also seems to be the biggest number of countries where the registration was from from national partners, which is Yemen, Turkey, and Nigeria. A bit. Um, the second finding that I found during this registration data is that we have 21% of registrants from national agencies. And they're from 22 operations. So you can see the map is kind of colored quite well. And it's 57 agencies. And not all of those 57 agencies have been counted for us in terms of cluster partners too. So we do have quite a lot of limitation in terms of those discrepancies. Um, I would like to ask at some point, who are you guys for basically in this call now at the moment from national partners that registered to come to this event, but we did not really count you as cluster partners at some point. It's a, uh, I'm, I'm myself quite curious about that. Um, so we do have challenges in terms of counting data, et cetera. And the last point that I wanted to say was, I did observe in the registration form that people who are working in terms of big agencies like Danish Refugee Council, NRC, um, IOM, UNICEF, at some point when they selected that they're national. I don't know if it was an issue in our form when we set it up in terms of um, if the question was not clear enough in what type of agency you're working, international or national, or is that consideration? And that kind of comes up for me to question also when we say local actors, one, and that's the question maybe for you and for Chris and for Jennifer to kind of talk about a bit more in the next stages. When we talk about local actors, do we mean agencies or do we mean actual people that are doing the actual work on the ground? Um, and it's kind of a question that I didn't have an answer when I was looking at the data and that kind of struck me a bit that I couldn't um, give more to you guys. No, thank you, Elisa, and, and I agree. I think um, maybe going back to yesterday's conversation, I mean, collecting data is, is also one of our biggest challenge when it comes to talking about localization. Um, I, I feel like um, we also, I think because it's also about like how you do CCCM. Um, I know that um, like, Anja, for example, who's with us from um, uh, HI. Um, you know, I think when we start talking with Anja um, from Indonesia, it's also like, oh, you don't, you don't call yourself as doing CCCM, but actually you're doing several components um, within, within what we list as a core responsibilities um, for, for camp managers. And I think, Elisa, it's great you mentioned because we definitely have some examples today as well of um, local uh, organizations that doesn't work within the, you know, our like formal kind of cluster um, system. And, and I think it'd be interesting to see whether, you know, we'd also look at, I think, I think we're seeing more and more cluster and coordination systems that is getting nationalized and, and localized. So, Without further ado, I think this is a good kind of segue. Sorry, Elisa, did you want to add something? No, I just have seen a question coming in the chat from Shantosh in terms of um, that we should be counting local actors that are not within the HRP. And my response to that, we did try to do that in 2020. Um, so a lot of times um, national or local actors are not really um, getting direct funding from the HRPs and HNOs. So they're going through 
um, bigger agencies. So we're basically funding that money, but we still try to give them as a cluster visibility as much as possible. And we do count them in as our partners as much as possible, uh, but it is a gap. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think whether like, um, because we don't often have at country level like cluster membership registration process, right? And then it's like more of a proxy counting of people who get funded to do CCCM activities. Um, so certainly a challenge on, on that side as well. Um, but as I was just going to introduce Chris Gadd, um, who's joining us from DRC, um, I think many of you already know Chris. Um, He's a head of emergency for DRC and also our very much valued um, member of the Global Strategic Advisory Group. So um, Chris, I guess from, from DRC side, um, maybe first, if you can maybe share with us from DRC, what are some of the key emergencies that are keeping you awake at night these days as an emerge, uh, head of emergencies? Uh, thanks, Juan, and, and hello, everyone. Um, I would say on, on new acute crises, uh, Tigray uh, is, is extremely concerning, and I think everybody has a focus on that. It's a huge protection crisis, and uh, now also with a very high risk of a widespread uh, famine. So uh, at the same time, the collective capacity to response is uh, inadequate, so there's a serious need to scale up. I, I think it's also important to mention, I mean, the handfuls of... Uh, of chronic crises such as South Sudan, Sahel, Yemen, um, to mention a few, um, where a humanitarian response is not the uh, the long term solution. It really calls for a political solution, but we see insufficient international political and diplomatic uh, investment to to uh, to solve the the crisis. Um, I think it's worth also to have in mind that um, all the above mentioned crises have. Uh, important elements of uh, camp-based displacement. So uh, just an illustration of the importance of uh, how we contribute to the collective response from, uh, from our cluster. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned um, Ethiopia because it's also one of the country where um, CCCM is relatively new sector in, in the country. Um, and we existed kind of informally for a little while and it was only this year that we got activated as a, as a full-fledged cluster. Um, and we'll also be part of the HRP. But it's also one of the country where we call it site management support. Um, and this is very much in relation to how we work uh, with the authorities in the country when it comes to managing displacement sites. And I mean, Chris, you're always, um, you're like our conscience on, on this topic in, in the SAG. Um, and I think you often question like, you know, what is our role then as a humanitarian you know, camp management agency um, in these kind of settings when you have the national or local authorities as a de facto camp managers, um, and and where where do we then fit in, or are we just there to support and provide technical kind of support along the way? Mm. I think that it's it's a quite complex uh, question you 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 pose there, uh, one, because I think it, it's quite a a wide area, but of course our, our response is to go into what at times is called uh, a site management support kind of like role. Um, it's something that we've seen more and more in, in, in different contexts. And, and I think there's reason to believe because state many places takes a stronger part now in the human turn response and, and not least when it's, uh, it's camp-based displacement. So we found ourselves, I mean, tweaking the classical camp management role into one that's our uh, site management support. But I think that really has been within a very wide spectrum, where at times, I mean, by name, it's been one or another state actor uh, taking on the camp management role, but de facto, it's been the site management support role that really has been carrying out the job. Whereas in, in other settings, it, it's much more of an, uh, of an advisory role. Um, but I think whether we, you know, Whatever the the extent to which we we get close to the camp management role, I think it's extremely important that we have in mind what the overall objective of uh, of camp management is. Which to me would be that it's it's uh, it's to create the best possible protective uh, environment in in, in camps. Um, 
and that we should do whether we are in advisory role or we take on a more direct role um that's what we uh, we need to strive for i think that's that's a really really valid point um i don't know if um but i mean do you think that's possible i mean are there any examples in which you see this kind of like division of responsibilities between the the state and the humanitarian actors when it comes to ensuring protection um a protective environment for displaced population i think it's it's worked fairly well a number of places but also been works also fairly inadequate but but let me i mean dodge the question a little bit and, and give okay. another angle uh, on on localization where i think i mean we just before i mean you you touched upon the definition of, of localization and i think it's it's quite important that and i think globally in our discussions that that remains a little bit unclear but i think it, an interesting element uh, on on camp management um with um creating the protective environment and the link to localization is that in a way i think it can be argued that successful camp management really aims at a localized response i mean it, it's about it's based on stakeholder mapping building on on the agency and the capa capacities of, of the affected population but certainly also the host population and involving i mean the participation two-way channels of communication governance structures etc and i think on, on stakeholders i also, also should have mentioned i mean local institutions be it state or non-state institutions i mean i think that's what we strive for and that's somewhat another angle on on, on a localized response and if you permit me i mean just to to go on I mean, to me, the way I see it, it's a bit that the importance of what we try to do is really a, a collective response. Um, and, and that's about, I mean, seeking complementarity between local, national and international actors who together then form the, the collective response. So, and I, and I think it, it's well respected that local and national actors have probably not historically been sufficiently respected for the important role they play. But, but having said that, I think it's important also to have in mind that, and this, I mean, admittedly is subjective in my personal opinion, that I do not see localization as an end in itself. To me, the goal is to, to build a better and more effective quality response. So the important is that whenever localization contributes to this, it is certainly for the greater good. And I think that's how I would propose we need to look at it and also move forward on, on camp management. Um, but that said, historically, also in camp management, I have no doubt that, that there's not been sufficient eye to local actors and how they contribute to what I call the collective response. Mm. Do you see any threat to like, you know, a better, more effective camp management response uh, at, in the way that the localization kind of direction we're going at? I mean, we know that human turn response globally is being politicized, it's being securitized, uh, there is a counter-terror mechanisms, the compliance, a lot of different regimes that limit humanitarian space. And also at times, I mean, we see states taking a very, very strong role in this. And certainly, I mean, if, it, if it's a one of whatever actor it might be who does not necessarily buy into the importance that, that camp management contributes to uh, enhancing or building the best possible protective environment, yes, I mean, uh, then it's a, it certainly, of course, is a, is a challenge to the um, to the quality of the collective response. Um, I think what we try to do when, when when we take on an SMS role, so support to the camp manager, is a, is of course, I mean, trying to to advocate and lobby for 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 standards. And I, I certainly hope that now with the minimum standards, that's also an instrument that we can we can use uh, to this effect. Also, when we work with the state actor in, in trying to measure, I mean, again, the work we do as camp managers or in the uh, SMS role, I mean, what benchmarks are we striving for? I mean, have we got the adequate response in place? Is there a capacity to carry on uh, um, the role as it should be, again, irrespective of whether it's one or another actor, which is not the important part in itself. The important part is that we succeed in reaching standards and, and uh, creating best possible um, protective environment. Mm. Would that be your kind of like, you know, your measure of this is success in localization, like that uh, we're able to achieve, monitor and, and maintain um, the standards as per the minimum standards for camp management? 
Yes, uh, I, I would say so. That's certainly certainly one. I mean, I, I, it's one approach to it. I think it's good. Of course, we got a number of other, I mean, human turn standards as well, but specifically for camp management, yes. Uh, at least maybe not in full, but at least in, in part. Uh, let's see. I think we all need to learn how we use the uh, the standards moving forward best possibly. Maybe reaching or finding also we need to develop, I mean, strong training packages that can contribute to the rolling out, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, sorry, I think I missed part of your your question, Juan. I'm not sure I answered it in, in full. I guess I guess what I, and I, I realized I also missed part of my question um, because it's about like you know where you were saying earlier that you know localization is not an end in itself. And so what what is the end? What does success mean? And does that mean that us? I mean, as like international organization, should we be out of the picture and still in like? You know, wh wh what is the end game here? I mean, to me, it, it, it's again, it's the collective response. I mean, collective. So having a wide definition of, of who we are, collectively speaking, um, and, and having the respect for everybody who can contribute to this. And, and it's, it's, it's a key issue for me to have the complementarity in, in, in place. I think early on in, 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 in a, let's say, sudden onset crisis in, in, whatever context where there's not been that kind of a crisis before. And let's say you have camp-based displacement. I don't think it's realistic to expect that there will necessarily be capacity in place. So therefore, I mean, it might be the um, very adequate that you have strong preparedness also from the global cluster level and from other maybe international actors. So you can deploy search capacity that has tried responding like this before. Um, I mean, later on in the crisis, I mean, the, the again, looking at complementarity, I mean, the added value of, of an international actor is probably lower than it is. And certainly, I mean, if they're like local slash national actors who can carry forward the response by all means, um, that, it, that, that would be, be good. But again, to me, I mean, localizing, if it's, com I mean, compromising the quality on it, it's not the right time, not a goal in, in, in itself. But of course, again, I mean, working together uh, at, at all different uh, levels, I mean, to me, is the uh, the way to go. But again, I mean, to reiterate what I said before, I have no doubt that historically, there's been an insufficient eye to the capacities and the elements of first response coming from uh, from local actors, including a host population very, very often. Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much, Chris. Um, that's really interesting. And I see the chat is kind of on fire. Um, I might ask Bruce to help me, just flag to me if there's anything, but I see that a lot of the questions are, are being answered already um, by others. Thank you so much for also contributing. I feel like, you know, as we're kind of working to define and, and set down kind of what the scope of, of localization looks like for CDCM, it's, I think it's all hands on deck at the moment. And and you know the panels we're invited here to speak is to share their experience, um, and and I don't think any of us would uh, you know profess to being the the expert on on the topic matter as yet. So I understand that Jen also have for us um, a poll question, um, so to help us transition into our before we go to our next speaker as well. So if you join us a little bit later, I see that there's more people now. Clearly, word is getting out on how exciting the conversation is going on today. Um, we're using Mentimeter um, throughout this session. Um, so please do grab your phone and join in. Um, so how well defined is localization in CCCM? I'm going to call on, I think I see Tom around somewhere. Tom. Hello. Hey, what do you Hi. think? Um, it's challenging because localization is very, it is different in different settings. But before I talk about this, I just want to say that I might have to run away because there's something strange happening in my camp now. So hopefully not. But if I suddenly drop off, then uh, that's why. Um, we just need you for a minute. <laughs> um, so localization is very, very dependent on each situation and it can be seen and defined by a lot of different people and interpreted in different ways. Um, 
the comments earlier about localization as a goal, I think are really valid because we're not, we're not ever going to be able to be in um, any camp or camp-like setting forever. There will always be a case where humanitarian actors arrive and then funding will drop and people will leave again. Um, and the question then is, who do we hand over to in civil society or within government? How can we strengthen the institutions? But how can we also strengthen the capacity of the individual um, refugees or IDPs um, to, to help themselves in that situation as well? And both those parts, the sort of the top up and the top down approaches are extremely important. And it's very challenging to... Um, to kind of sift through all of that mm. complicated environment because it is so dependent on each setting. In some places, there'll be a very strong government. In some places, there won't be a very strong government. And then the localization approach that will, the, uh, that will be taken is going to be completely different. Are you, are you saying that we need to localize our localization definition in different contexts? <laughs> That's that's horrifically complicated. Um, I think <laughs> okay. if we localized our localization definition, then we'd probably have to localize the localization of our localization definitions eventually, um, and it would become it just would become more and more context specific. Uh, but it'd be very hard to do that. Very um, good. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank hard. you for that, Tom. And um, and I see that I think most of our participants also agree that um, well disagree or agree that it's not an easy or well-defined um, term and definition and, and concept at, at this point. Um, mm. I think we have a lot of really good and interesting examples that are going on in different, in different contexts. And we're certainly, oh, even I think the mentee is working with me because we're moving towards more and more better defined um, um, as a view as I speak. So I feel like we're kind of moving in that direction. Um, but as usual, we are definitely, you know, building from the ground up, looking at where things are working, how things are being applied. And I think trying to shape and define the scope and definition as, as we go. So next up, I have Ben and Hilo joining uh, me from Mogadishu. Um, Ben is the um, is our global uh, sorry is our CCCM cluster coordinator um, for Somalia, um, and with uh, with Ben we also have Hilo, who is a program manager for Safe Somali Women as well. So, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank um, you for having me. Thanks, Hilo. If I can just hear you to make sure that. Your mic is working. Yeah, I can hear. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. So Ben, I, I mean, let's start with you, um, because I think from where I'm sitting, you've been really passionate and very active about pushing on localization um, effort in, in Somalia. Um, why don't you give us like a, a quick overview on background on where that's going? Yeah, definitely. Um, so to provide a bit of an overview when it comes to the displacement context in Somalia, it's quite complex. So we currently have roughly 2,400 IDP sites that are accommodating roughly 2.9 million individuals. So as you can conceptualize, it's a fairly vast and uh, scattered uh, response. Um, and when it comes to the response as well um, for Somalia, it's important to note that the CCCM cluster is relatively new. It's only four years old within Somalia. However, the displacement crisis is, um, has been with Somalis for quite some time now. So displacement and the um, emphasis and need for CCCM and site management is something that is regularly known by individuals and practitioners who are working in Somalia. Um, mostly because we have various sites that have been established for 20 or 30 years um, and are fairly visible within certain urban areas within Somalia. Um, so within Somalia, we, we have a keen interest on localization, mostly because we do have a quite large number of active CCCM partners that are local partners. And when I say active, I mean they are uh, physically implementing CCCM activities and reporting these activities to the cluster.
Sorry, is that my turn or? A... Yes, it is. <laughs> so how many is many then? So at the, more, at the moment, we have 14 partners that are implementing CCCM activities. However, we do have quite a large number of local partners that are actively attending CCCM cluster events, coordination meetings, trainings, workshops, in addition to having a presence in IDP sites um, at the subnational level, so at the district level. Um, so as an initiative that has been established by the CCCM cluster in Somalia, we have established a localization framework and a localization work plan that has come out of a, um, a few localization workshops that we've had in joint collaboration with the Somalia NGO Consortium, but also inclusive of various donors that have a, a stake when it comes to localization, but also providing funds to humanitarian responses and IDP sites. Um, ultimately, with these workshops really allowing for us to create this localization framework um, from the voices of uh, local partners who have um, suggested different activities and different initiatives that we should focus on collectively as a cluster. Uh, and I'm happy to go through those in, in a bit more depth as well. Mm. I mean, I think most clusters at country level that I, you know, that I worked in or coordinate, I mean, we, we'd be lucky we have five partners um, working in CCCM. <laughs> and so, but why, so why do you think there's so many local partners in, in Somalia? Yeah, I would say a few, a few reasons why we have a large number of local partners. Um, as I mentioned, displacement is not a new phenomenon within Somalia. Um, it's, it's very visible in most of the urban uh, settings within the country to see a large number of displacement settlements. Um, they're fairly visible in terms of um, just their aesthetics and the composition of such settlements. Um, but displacement is, is very much um, something that a lot of Somalis uh, have a very close and intimate relationship with, unfortunately, just based on um, you know, different uh, emergencies and shocks related to climate change or, or also conflicts related uh, shocks as well. Um, so I believe that a number of local humanitarian agencies that are responding in IDP sites, they really understand the value of having CCCM as the anchor of the humanitarian response in a camp-like setting or settlement. And because of this, they really see an added value of complementing some of their wash activities or protection activities with CCCM as a way to enhance participation and accountability, uh, but also as a way to ensure that um, some of their activities are, are supported and that some of the needs and gaps are, are better um, understood for some of their other departments, in addition to other agencies that are also operating within the site. Mm -hmm. No, totally. Um, I, th I think that's, that's like an ideal kind of, I think, attitude from, from humanitarian actors um, related to CCCM. But do you agree with uh, Ben um, Hillo, if I can come to you? Yeah, sure. Uh... I think uh, he gave us uh, an actual picture of what's happening on the ground and uh, the, the kind of efforts the uh, both INGOs and local organizations are, are putting in to kind of reverse the, the effects of, of this. So, hello, I understand that um, Save Somali Women and Children used to be an active member of the CCCM cluster um like wh what happened and and why not anymore well uh, if by active you you're referring to having an, an an active ccm project currently in place well then we're not and uh, we are we're actually a member of uh, of the ccm cluster but uh, just like ben said there are a number of organizations uh, uh, majorly local who are we are not uh, having currently CCCM projects running, but are actively participating in cluster operations, like uh, you know meetings and uh, and those other kind of activities that the cluster organizes. And yeah, we, we are currently part of that, but uh, we have been a major and uh, an active part of the CCCM cluster. Uh, as Ben said, it, it, the cluster is active for four years. I believe. Uh, 
I, I joined the organization a little bit later after the CCM cluster was uh, operationalized, but I believe uh, SSWC was one of the very first organizations that began uh, the CCCM projects in Somalia because currently, so far we have implemented uh, seven uh, CCCM projects with the list running uh, half a year. So uh, we, we have been an active uh, CCCM uh, uh, cluster member. So if I can uh, briefly go through, uh, maybe to take you through like uh, for the, since 2018, December, until 2020 April, we implemented four CCCM projects, uh, majorly in uh, Mogadishu and uh, parts of Galmuduk region. Uh, we have implemented uh, projects, like four projects within uh, a number of districts within this uh, within these regions in, in Somalia, and uh, we have targeted of a hundred uh, IDP sites within within these specified regions, and uh, and uh, we were able to to support over a hundred uh, over a hundred thousand beneficiaries, whether direct or indirect beneficiaries, uh, with CCCM activities like uh, uh, creating and uh, active and. Uh, a highly participatory CCCM structures that manage the, the IDP sites, uh, undertaking service mapping regularly and uh, updating the CCCM uh, cluster, uh, conducting referrals of uh, needs and service gaps that exist within the, CC, within the IDP site, and uh, undertaking site maintenance activities to make uh, the, the IDP sites more of, uh, habitable and uh, accessible to humanitarian aid workers and, and the other service providers that who are targeting those IDP sites. And uh, we've also established some community structure, community centers uh, that support the communities uh, to conduct uh, to conduct functions and uh, activities that bring them together and uh, and uh, and support them work to work well with the with the service providers uh, like humanitarian organizations and the government agencies that would like to uh, have an engagement with those communities. And uh, we went ahead within these uh, projects to, to organize and conduct uh, site level coordination meetings. Uh, by site level, uh, I mean, the, the coordination meetings were done so regularly, like in, on a monthly basis, some of them on fortnightly, so the meetings what uh, took place within the IDP sites in the particular community centers we have established. And these meetings brought together a number of uh, stakeholders that operate within that particular district. We are targeting uh, stakeholders like uh, humanitarian service providers and uh, government agencies and, and key community groups uh, who are like uh, CSOs and uh, other active uh, organizations that operate within the IDP mm. site. So mm. we did all this and uh, we have achieved uh, uh, what I can describe as uh, uh, we moved the community from a certain a certain stage to a better one and uh, with, the, with the governance structures in place and uh, that uh, with, with, uh, with the leaders who are well trained and, uh, and uh, well trained on the principles of CCCM and uh, who are able to actively engage in any activity uh, with uh, with any humanitarian organization or, or any other government agency for that matter that that yeah. uh, is interested in supporting the IDPs. Yeah. Do you feel like um, that as a as a local organization that the cluster in any way also supported you to do? I mean, what sounds to me like a really impressive um, work that that you were doing there. Is there, I mean, you mentioned a little bit capacity building. Was there anything else that was done to help you kind of in the, in the sector? Well, uh, the, the cluster is, has, has always been part of uh, whatever activities that we are implementing, uh, be it uh, capacity building, be it the development of uh, tools that are collectively agreed on 
to to advance the, the agenda and the objectives of the CCCM cluster and the ways of uh, engaging the communities uh, to, to better deliver the services and uh, and and create the cluster has has also supported in the creation of uh, of, uh, of of referral pathways through which uh, any CCCM partner operating within the IDP sites uh, can 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 conduct their service mapping or, or rather uh, periodic uh, detailed site assessments and uh, and so safety audits and all that uh, periodically and and uh, share those reports through the cluster and to all other uh, other CCCM uh, practitioners within the country and uh, the needs and the gaps that exist within the IDP sites with the potential service providers uh, that, that, are also, that also belong to other uh, national clusters that, like the health and you know, wash and all that. So mm -hmm. whatever, whatever activities we were doing, the cluster amplified our efforts and, and uh, took the initiative to share whatever gaps that are existing within the IDP sites to the other clusters for potential response. Mm. Do you do you also work like in partnership with uh, international NGOs as well? Well, with the with the, with SWC we do that, but uh, there has been uh, there has been no such uh, a partnership, uh, particularly related to the CCCM projects we have done so far. Mm -hmm. But in in general, is that something? Is that a modality that you think uh, works well for, for? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And uh, we have done this with a number of organizations, like uh, like NCA, IRC, uh, CRS, uh, ACTED. Yeah, we've done a number of uh, projects with 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 INGOs in uh, through partnerships, and uh, we were able to. Most, most of them related to emergencies that occur, you know, periodically, flash floods and you know, COVID nineteen responses, RCC. So yeah, the, the approach sort of works well. Hmm. And and do you feel like an equal partner in this, or uh, or is it more of a funding arrangement? Not really. We, we feel as an equal partner because uh, in most cases with with the, with the INGOs we have worked with. Uh, usually, right from the development of uh, concept notes, we are engaged and we we contribute heavily to that, and we advance together progressively until we secure funds and then we collectively do our parts in, in in ensuring that the project is implemented successfully. Hmm. So yeah, I think you're breaking the um the norm of uh, several memes that we've seen on. Uh, on localization um, in general, you're making it sound like it, it worked pretty well for you, or? Well, uh, like uh, I think, uh, like I had uh, Tom say, we need to localize the, the, the definition of, uh, of, 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 uh, of localization itself. Uh, I, I think this is uh, sort of not that much related to this is we are talking about partnerships and, and how how efficient they can work when implementing humanitarian projects. But when it comes to I think localization is sort of a different thing. Mm. I don't know if if we are, if I can if I'm making I don't know if I'm making sense. Like yeah. uh, like when when we have uh, uh, I think it was Chris saying something like uh, if we we. If we work together, uh, with, I mean, the INGOs and and and, and uh, local or national NGOs work together, and uh, we can we can collectively achieve uh, an, an overall goal that uh, that is to to better the the lives of uh, the lives in IDP sites and and usually the usual challenges the IDPs are facing. But uh, when I I move from these partnerships, partnerships work well depending on the kind of agreements and, and arrangements that are in place. But if we talk of localization, I think it's a different thing. I don't know if you can allow me to go deep into that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, if you would like. Um, yeah. I think, uh, uh, I, I, according to me, I believe uh, 
localization sort of uh, focuses on and on empowering local organizations so that they can have uh, the ability to res respond well to the needs and 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 emergencies that occur within the needs of IDPs or, or host communities and 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 the, the and the and the emergencies that occur periodically uh, that are very common sometimes. So, given the the the, the position, I, uh, local NGOs and national NGOs, uh, the position they have within the communities, I think they have an advantage, sort of maybe uh, of a, a competitive advantage of a, of I NGOs, I would say, uh, because. Uh, despite the fact that people say they have, uh, they have, uh, uh, their capacities are, are limited, the technical capacities are limited, but they have other advantages, like they have, they, they are closer to the people and then there are people, there are places that INGOs would describe as hard to reach areas. And, in the, and, and the, you will be surprised to find a number of uh, local NGOs and national NGOs operating within these areas simply mm. because they understand well the dynamics and the, and the, mm. they have the dynamics within the area and uh, what what to be what to be to be cautious of and, and what what kind of precautionary measures to put in place who to talk to and uh, those kind of details like they have also a, a, a close working relationship with the key stakeholders that within within a particular area, like like the the local administrations, that are very supportive when it comes to implementing projects, and uh, and uh, when you look at uh, usually there are emergencies that need responses like flash floods and, and such. So in such situations, you might find that INGOs, despite the fact that emergencies require swift responses, they might have a lot of bureaucracies and processes in place uh, that might uh, that might delay the response so regarded uh, national NGOs and local NGOs have resources at their disposal at any one given time in the event uh, in the event that uh, emergencies occur they have less bureaucracies uh, so they, they have uh, they can have an amazingly swift response to, to such I have a case in point, uh, though we had had a, a huge support and uh, sort of, uh, uh, and an, an, I don't know if I can use this word, sort of an, an anticipatory approach to to the occurrences of these uh, emergencies. There's a project we worked with, uh, with ACTED in, 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 in Baladwain. So uh, Baladwain is a place well known for having uh, 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 sporadic rains and that cause uh, uh, like every year there are flash floods that cause devastating effects within that affect both host communities and IDPs. So we had had a project that was was meant to run for 45 days and uh, I was the lead in that particular project and I can assure you that we had responded so fast uh, in providing the most basic uh, basic needs uh, to the communities so situations differ but uh, if i can if i weigh i believe uh, local and national NGOs are placed well to respond to this only that they are limited by by resources they usually lack resources there, mm -hmm. there has been there has been the the, the, the historic uh, uh, narrative that uh, the, the technical capacities are not uh, sufficient but uh, lately, there have been dramatic changes and improvements uh, in these technical capacities within the national organizations. But currently, the, the most limiting factor is the, 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 the availability of resources. Yeah. No, thank you so much for that, Hilo. Um, and, and I think you raise a lot of um, really interesting, well, I guess, also, like you also share with us from your perspective how you would define localization, which I, I think it's, yeah, I mean, a little bit of a moment for me, also um, a little light bulb. Um, but I also in, in, in a lot of chat, and I think it's what's really coming across in my quick browse is also this discussion on like non binary, you know, it's um, 
it's not quite either or, or it's, uh, you know, what Chris was saying, how it's a collective. Um, and, and I think what Dear is saying is also true on like, you know, related to what Alisa was saying, or like the definition of where your organization sit within this spectrum can also be like less straightforward and, and clear. But I think for, I mean, I think um, Hilo brought up a number of, I think opportunities, but also challenges that comes around, you know, working in, in a response where, you know, localization is very much a conscious effort. Um, and, and I think that comes with, you know, benefits um, and, and challenges. Um, so, which relates a little bit for, on our, uh, for our next uh, mentee question, um, is where you're given a hundred points, a hundred points, I was thinking like a hundred dollars to spend on, to work on the different um, challenges uh, or factors, actually, I would you know, maybe some are opportunities, actually. Um, actually, no. Yeah. So if you were to be given a hundred dollars to spend on working on these um, different factors, how much would you allocate uh, to these different areas? Maybe I'm going to call on you, Anja, while uh, people are voting. Anja, I saw you. <laughs> here hi Anja Hello. so what would you spend your hundred dollar on um, based on these four different factors uh, <laughs> well uh, I, I guess uh, the first one um, I mean uh, uh, it's it it, it, it we're all on uh, genuine partnership I think uh, because uh, uh, I mean uh, I mean ca capacity building is is is, is one thing um, you, you mentioned funding is also uh, another but then uh, having uh, working together equally uh, that's that's a whole different story. It's uh, it's it's something where uh, where we have a we have someone to work with uh, uh, <clears throat> relevantly on on uh, gaps that we're we're facing and uh, and uh, it doesn't always have to be uh, some national partners that that has this this these gaps but uh, but uh, I think we are also seeing uh, international NGOs are. Are also experiencing gaps when uh, it's uh, it's about uh, acceptance, for instance. Um, and so, uh, I think this is also where where uh, national or local NGOs come in. So uh, I think um, genuine partnership is is uh, is quite important in my book. I thank you so much, Anja, and and I apologize for just putting you on the spot. But I think it's, it's really interesting because it links back again to that word cloud we had right at the beginning. You know, it comes down to this, like the power, the relationship. And, and, I, and I agree, I think, and most people here also agree that, you know, often money is, is a big part of that kind of balance as well of, of power. Um, but I, I really appreciate um, how you see this as like, you know, the, the foundation of, of all everything else is to we start off on the same um, at the same step, right? I mean, it's uh, that we're going to work together as as equals, and and that this is a genuine partnership. Um, thank you for that, Anja. Um, and uh, as as you continue to vote, I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce you to our next. Um, last but not least um, speaker, oh, well, nearly last, um, I just realized. Um, I have Dia Sinandang who's joining us um, from the Humanitarian Forum Indonesia or HFI. Um, and she's the, um, the communication and, and partnership manager at HFI. Um, and I think for those of you who don't work in Indonesia, 
Um, I'm going to ask Dia to tell us a little bit about what does this mean? Like, what is HFI? Oh, thank you, Juan, and thanks for having me. So HFI basically is a forum of uh, faith-based organizations. Um, we have currently 18 members uh, consisting from uh, Islamic, uh, Catholic, and Christian organizations. Um, and we are working through all the phases of uh, disaster um, and, and uh, humanitarian crisis. Um, so my role uh, is to coordinate and facilitate the members um, in, in their response. Cool. I mean, like with the logos you're showing, it's uh, you're kind of like, yeah. our mini, like uh, equivalent to our mini Ocha um, for Indonesia. No, it's like but it's it, a big consortium. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a big consortium because um, we... Uh, also don't have uh we we also have uh, members that is a network themselves uh, maybe as i mentioned in the chat um it is really hard to define whether they are uh, national or local because they have uh network members under uh under their coordination so they are widespread all over indonesia and they are very big <laughs> mm, yeah no i mean it must be a and indonesia is also I mean, I think the the geographical coverage and and islands is also must must make um, the coordination, but also contextualization uh, really challenging. Um, um, Indonesia also has another really unique uh, thing, which is um, how the cluster system has been nationalized. Um, Maybe you can initiate some of us in, into this new cluster system. Actually, not so new. It's uh, it's been around for a while now. Yeah, um, it's been around since um, two thousand fourteen, I believe. Uh, regulated under the head of uh, national disaster management uh, agencies uh, decree. So we have here eight national clusters. Uh, design uh, from the global cluster, but uh, some of them have differences because here we really don't have a telecom a cluster, but here we have SAR cluster. Uh, so you can see the localization meaning is to really adjust uh, the needs of the country, whether uh, they want to establish a new cluster uh, from the global or not. And the CCCM is uh, coordinated as a subcluster, so it's really different from the global one. Uh, CCCM is not uh, standing as a standalone cluster, but it's uh, being coordinated as a subcluster. Mm. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, yeah, so uh, from the eight um, clusters that we have, uh, we have the biggest one is the displacement and protection. And uh, from you, you, you can see from the slide that CCCM is a subcluster under that uh, cluster. Uh, we have um, very exciting meaning why CCCM is put under that uh, cluster uh, of, of uh, displacement and protection. Uh, because um, here in Indonesia, we uh, think that protection uh, simply means as security. Uh, so that's why the camp management, uh, the camp coordination, uh, we think as uh, also the security issue. So that's why maybe you can see from the slide that uh, that cluster is coordinated also by the police. Yeah, no, and, and I think it's, um, it's, as always, it was interesting to go to Indonesia and kind of like learn the cluster system um, that is being used there. My understanding, though, also is that because such a, for such a big country with really wide geographical coverage, one of the challenge is also to apply the system at like a subnational level. Um, I mean, I don't know if you know you also have um, HFI partners that that work at subnational level surely i mean can you explain a little bit about that as well um yeah for the cluster at the local level uh provincial and district of uh, whether the status is put um we uh tend to 
uh, follow what the local area has decided. If they already have an established one, uh, let's say they had name it as a forum, uh, as a DR forum or as alliance. Uh, so we follow that mechanism. Uh, we don't establish a new one. But if they don't uh, really have understanding of what is coordination, what is the cluster system, then uh, we from the national actors try to um, assist them in understanding that and establish a cluster system. But it will be based on uh, what kind of uh, cluster that they want to establish, uh, depend on the response uh, that is happening on that local area. Mm. So, yeah. And do you take on, do you or your um, like members also take on coordination roles as well? Yes, um, some of uh, the members, uh, also facilitating the government like uh, Anjar from Human Initiative. Uh, they are uh, facilitating uh, the cluster of displacement and protection while uh, West Sulawesi uh, having um, earthquake uh, uh, last year. And then also the members, uh, some members also facilitating the RR forum at the provincial level or maybe a task force of CVA assistance, uh, and so many members are doing that. Hmm. So it effectively, I guess you're kind of, I think like you have to do localization within Indonesia as well, right? Um, and, it's, yes. and it's interesting to hear that you're doing it based on like what is happening on, on the ground and, and you're trusting the local um, set up to kind of feed back into, into the, the national um, level. Um, is there not a lot of problem with that? <laughs> well, um, yeah, as you mentioned before, Indonesia is very wide. So um, sometimes it is hard to uh, make coordination, especially uh, during the the golden time of three days, uh, first response days. Um, we try to uh, to really push this agenda of, of localization, meaning by equipping their capacity, uh, given direct mentorship, and uh, really put that local actors in charge. Uh, they decide whether, what capacity what they, they want, uh, what time they want to be coordinated even in, in the coordination meeting and then really connect to the government, really connect to the uh, other humanitarian networks that uh, is responding there. So if you uh, ask me, what is the challenge? The challenge is so many one, um, but uh, yeah, we try to, to push that localization agenda. <laughs> um. No, thank you. And thank you so much, dear, for, uh, for sharing with us um, like the, the context and the, the system that is being put into place in Indonesia. I'm gonna ask Bruce whether he has any questions from the chat that um, he thinks we should put forward to the, the speakers. Um, so just looking through the, the chat, I mean, I think there are a lot of very, <clears throat> excuse me, um, very a lot of very interesting questions that are coming out and a lot of interesting debate between participants. We have a question here sort of um, about um, the definition of localization and whether or not it is about um, only about empowering local organizations capacity or also involves empowering locally recruited staff, um, whether at UN or international agencies, including the um, the volunteers or staff we might have from affected populations. Um, I don't know if any of the speakers has a strong sort of point of view on, on how this would fit into the localization discourse or whether or not that is something separate um, that we're talking about. I wonder if I can ask Chris on this. Do you think as a international organization can also be localized, I guess? Is that? Hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's a very very valid point, and I I, I fully agree. And it's also something that's being I mean discussed uh, in my own organization related to uh, diversity discussions in general, right? I mean, how good are we at uh, empowering um, I mean local and national staff, etc., and advancement within the organization? But related to the question, I mean, also at the response at hand, making sure there is a voice. And to me, it refers a bit back to what I talked about with. When we succeed in, in implementing quality camp management, it really is about also, I mean, the the local agency of the affected population, the host population of the context, and certainly at times, I mean, very important actors in, in that is also, I mean, the local staff, be that volunteers or, or, or locally hired staff. I mean, less so necessarily, I mean, in, not in all cases, I would say the national staff, who might be from a very different part of the country and be, you know, living in the capital and now being deployed as a kind of like within the nation, a kind of like uh, internet expat staff in, in a sense. But um, so, so certainly, yes, I think it's a very valid point and, and uh, we should always in the structure of our, our response, uh, our operations, try to, to take that uh, best possibly into account. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I, um... maybe if I could play devil's advocate. Oh, sorry, one. Did you have something to say? No, go ahead. I guess, um, you know, if, if we're considering local, uh, international organizations that have locally recruited staff as being localized, are we not going against the sort of the core concept of localization, which is about sort of dressing power imbalances? So if you, if your staff, if you have local, if you're an international, you know, NGO, you have only local staff, but key decisions are still made in Geneva, Copenhagen, New York, wherever, is that um, appropriately sort of implementing a local localization um, uh, um, transition? I mean, if, if I may, I mean, I wouldn't argue that, that it was like localization hmm. per se, but I think it would enhance the likelihood that, that our part of the collective response um, was taking, you know, local knowledge into account. Um, hmm. but, but I wouldn't argue that it would be substituting if there was a quality local actor who had comparative advantages compared to my own international organization and another, that they shouldn't then take the lead role. Um, okay. But but mm -hmm. I mean, I think within the, the role we might play in a given operation, we are, you know, accountable for looking into, I mean, taking the local agency of the affected population best possible into account. And that's one of the ways we can do that. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's more about, you know, leading to a better collective response than, I would use it as an argument that this is localizing as such. I see that um, Yaksan also has a strong uh, reaction to this. Yaksan, do you want to say something? I see your comments about um, like you can't have true partnership without transfer of responsibility. Um, and also a comment from Tom around like, you know, if you're going bottom up, you can't do it if you're not empowered. Um, Yaksan, do you want to? Yes, I mean, I see a very interesting talk. I mean, as a local NGO working in Syria, some other NGOs tried this, uh, we call it game for local NGO. They try to establish local NGO and they still have all the decisions. So it's just like the term in business, it's like McDonaldization, the business. So we're still doing the work, it's still doing, but it's a whole, uh, in business, they call it a profit, go back to the HQ, right? So basically it's, uh, I mean, it's a valid point. I see where the INGO is coming from. But again, for local NGO, if this happens, and it happened here, I mean, you know, we, we I mean, most of you know the cross border resolution, and now they have to work with the local NGO. And some INGO established local, uh, local entities. So they getting the local NGO out. So uh, honestly, it might be, if you look at it from INGOs, it might be a good arm to implement, but will not be good for localization as well. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Um, maybe we do have a little bit of time. Um, ben, do you want to come in? Ben and Hilo, do you want to just come in and say anything on this as well? Um, sure, yeah. I, I think um, the point made related to how it's so crucial to have equitable partnerships, I mean, it cannot be understated. Um, if there are, if there is going to be a partnership, it simply should not be the traditional implementing partner um, relationship, which is so so known and so traditional within the sphere. 
It should be um, a partnership that allows for the local partner to have complete buy-in when it comes to the work plan, when it comes to the project development, and also the equitable distribution of resources as well, um, financial resources, but also access to um, support costs as well. Um, I mean, this is something that we, we've tried to incorporate within our uh, cluster localization framework just to detail what these partnerships should look like, because I fully agree that there is a need for a, a trans, I guess, sort of um, a transference of, of power within that relationship. And that looks very different than what we see traditionally in the humanitarian response, where it's a local agency that's implementing for a international agency. There needs to be a, a, a complete equitable divide of resources and uh, an equitable divide of the responsibility as well. Thank you for that, uh, Ben. Um, anything from you, Hilo? So I'm still also catching up on the, the chat because I think it's <laughs> the world has happened um, in the chat while we were talking. Omar, you have your hands up as well. I saw your comment also about like different pros and cons of different entities. Do you want to make that comment? Yeah, thank you, Juan. Quickly, um, the most important thing uh, uh, I think from my experience that um, the international NGOs or international actors are almost neutralized. They are neutral. They are not uh, like the local NGOs. Sometimes they are kind of following the government or some sector within that area. So this is one of the points that, that make, make it uh, more reliable. Uh, plus the capacity, as have been discussed in the chat and uh, during the meeting, and um, there are simple things, for example, in, in Arabic, uh, we said idara, which means we give two different uh, uh, meaning in English, which is administration or management. And this is totally different. It's it's very tiny uh, thing, but it the, the impact of this is huge. So you if you if you are going to 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 consider this starting by this tiny issue and go up. Uh, to to study and dig further, you will find a lot of disadvantages, as well as you will have many advantages, as uh, Jennifer explained in her uh, appreciated comment. Over. Mm. Thank you so much on that. Um, and on that point, we have one last poll questions, well, set of poll questions for you. And I really hope that even if you've not been answering any of the other polls, this is the poll you want to do it because you're going to help us shape how we're going to move localization discussion forward in CCCM. So Jen, please, yep. Yeah. If you didn't catch it earlier, it's 96342065. And we're really, really interested to know what you think about what we should be doing to move this um, discussion forward. I think for many of you um, who join us at the last uh, meeting where we had Anja, we had uh, Yaksan also, amongst others as our speakers on the localization session. I mean, it's really great to see you join us again. And, and I feel like this is also part of the fruit of our earlier discussion and, and also like where we're gonna hopefully go together, um, hand in hand. Um, so what I'm seeing is I, it's a little bit of an equal opportunity at the moment between capacity, like focus on building capacity and an advocate for direct funding. Though I see also like, I think capacity assessment um, also coming on strong. I think it's interesting, recently we had, uh, we were drafting a paper around localization in, in coordination um, as part of the, um, 
so I'm not going to get um, as part of this result group uh, one and and I think we made a really strong point the capacity assessment also go both ways you know it's not only about the gap um, but also what uh, I think as many as mentioned in in the chat that uh, maybe it's a, you know a technical question but also like what different components and then I think it's about making a whole out of like different parts in order to make sure that we move towards you know what Chris say is um, effective and and good um, programming to ensure a protective environment um, localization framework of ours Charlie or do we have no do you mean Marco and uh, Ben were just having a conversation about ah. uh, sharing localization framework. And I just wondered if we might be able yes. to put it on the website. Yes. Um, yes, indeed. I think Ben and, and also in Ethiopia, we're also working also on the strategy to, to push for localization in CCCM as well. Um, and I think a big thanks to Ben, I think, for being the trailblazer um, at the cluster level, especially. And I think it's, it's, it's always, you know, very beneficial to work off uh, what someone, someone else or some other clusters and operations have, have tried and tested. Um, and I'm seeing, actually, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you have both to do capacity assessment, but also to build national and and local authorities um, build capacity for local and national authorities on CCCM, as well as advocating for direct funding. I think that has definitely been happening um, around advocacy on funding. Like there's more and more commitment around percentage of pooled funding going to local organizations, for example. Um, That's very true. Phil, do you want to, I mean, as I, maybe it's good to hear your voice from the donor's perspective. I mean, there is like commitment for more funding to local organization, more flexible funding and, you know, like, but how is that going? Um, I, I probably won't speak too much to uh, FCDO funding at the moment in, in the main, but yeah, uh, specifically cool. around, um, around our new humanitarian funding guidelines, which we've just updated. Um, basically, our if, if we're funding, let's say, uh, one agency, and they are then subcontracting a number of local NGOs, we now mandate that whatever percentage for overhead and, and project administration we're giving to that first grantee, that grantee then needs to pass the same percentage against any money that they're passing to local NGOs, um, which helps to give them a bit more of a seat at the table and, and to deal with the, with the cost of implementation. Thanks, Juan. Over. Yeah, I think that's very fair. I mean, I think even, uh, yeah. Um, Jen, I know that we have the, can we skip one question and just go to the last poll question? Um, Or we can just skip the rest of the questions as well. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I, um, as we come towards towards the end of of our discussion, um, well, now most of you have known Bruce, I guess. If not today, then the last few days. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Bruce to talk about the localization task force that started up after the last global meeting. Sure, thanks a lot, Juan. Um, so uh, hi, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Bruce, and I'm working with the global CCCM cluster team. And I'm going to be facilitating um, a localization task force, um, which is going to start next month. And uh, I just want to say I thought the discussions today were really interesting, um, and I, I'm really going to feed into some of the things that we want to accomplish as a, as a task force. Um, I think a lot of the discussions we've had today about how hard it is to define 
localization um, within the humanitarian sector as a whole um, also feed into the conversations that I think we need to have um, in terms of defining what localization means um, within CCCM, because a lot of the same issues, of course, like uh, apply um, to CCCM, but we also have the CCCM framework, which we sort of need to uh, investigate and unpack um, camp administration, camp coordination and camp management. You know, what does localization mean within each of those different areas, right? And it's going to create probably quite a, a large amount of work streams. You know, things like from uh, capacity assessments, uh, how do we change our coordination architecture, its leadership, its membership, um, but also how do we localize uh, camp management programming? Because um, I think I saw some comments um, in the chat, which I thought were really relevant, which are, um, this isn't necessarily just about um, agencies and agencies that we work with, but also the affected communities that we work with and what do they consider localization and how does localization link in with um, how camp managers do community engagement and participation. So I think um, there's a lot to work with there. Um, you might ask, considering everything that we've just heard, how do you address localization at a global level, considering that no one at a global level seems to really have their hand on what it actually means? And I kind of agree with you. I think the, the very concept of localization it has to be something that is very much locally driven. And I think that came out in the conversations where um, people from different contexts highlighted um, either good practices um, that are enabling localization and what the factors are within that specific context that helped enable localizing response and how they defined localization, such as what Ben presented um, from Somalia. And then other people have highlighted barriers to localization in certain contexts, possibly more to do with context of armed conflict, which I think are very relevant. So the task force is essentially going to try and um, unpack these issues um, at a global level. And I think the advantage that we have as a global cluster is that we um, were able to do sort of like comparative analysis um, of our different CCCM responses and understand the different barriers um, and enabling factors within each context that allow for localizations and to provide cluster coordinators with the tools and guidance on how to undergo those processes, um, if you believe it is a process, uh, at their response level. Um, but in order to do that, for the localization task force to be successful, um, we need to have uh, strong local and national NGO members in order to put forth their voices and also help us design the tools uh, that we need and input into the conversations that we need to have. So um, a call for expression of interest for local slash national NGOs will be put out um, by the end of this week. Um, essentially, the process will be for any local or national NGO who's interested in being a member of this task force, they have to fill in a form and send it to their CCCM cluster coordinator who will compile all of the interested NGOs. And then at the first meeting of the uh, task force in July, we'll be reviewing all of the applications, um, sort of uh, agreeing and def def uh, designing what the task force membership will look like, and then reaching out to those to those local and national uh, NGOs. And that meeting will also be outlining the key tasks and timelines for the deliverables of that task force. Um, if you move to the next slide, I can give you the sort of like the key sort of three deliverables that the task force is aiming to accomplish. And it's gonna be a time bound task force. So this isn't going to drag on forever. We want to we want to really get on with this work. Could you move Bruce, to the next slide please, Jennifer? Bruce, what if there isn't a cluster in the country? If there isn't a cluster, well, I think even if there isn't a cluster, there are coordination forums and interagency bodies that we'll be reaching out to, to ask for nominations um, of local and national NGOs. Um, so they will also be included in that call for uh, expression of interest. Um, so just checking the time, two minutes. Okay, so the three uh, main sort of outputs that the task force is going to be looking at is um, surveying the challenges facing local organizations, um, implementing CCCM programs across administration, coordination and management in varying contexts. Try to propose a definition for the CCCM cluster, which respects the views of local organizations and uh, clarifies um, that within the CCCM framework. And then lastly, 
based on those two outputs, try and develop tools that will support country clusters in developing their own localization strategies, taking into account the particulars of their contexts that will address and enhance the delivery of CCCM programming coordination um, and policies um, uh, within their responses. Um, so yeah, if you are interested, please reach out to your cluster coordinators. And um, by the end of July, we should have formulated the task force task force membership. Thanks. Great stuff. Um, thank you very much, Bruce. And um, please, please do. I think we would like you to be part of this discussion going forward. Um, as much as I'm sure you would like your voice to be heard at the global level um, discussions around localization um, for CCCM. Um, I also just want to say a quick thank you to Chris, to Ben, Hilo, and Dia as well for joining us today and, and talking about localization. And also thank you for all of those um, that I just uh, drop in on uh, without any announcement. Um, thank you again for being game and just uh, joining in, sharing your thought and, and asking questions. Um, I feel like I need to go back and read the chat again and probably have a big thought um, around, you know, all the other conversations that were going on in this session. So back to you, Charlie, thank you so much. <laughs>